Suddenly a light from heaven flashes, and blinded by the light, Saul falls to the ground. Then he hears a voice to which he asks, Who are you? And the response comes back, I am Jesus. And then from there, Saul is blind, doesn't know what has just happened to him, not sure what to make of this incredible experience. Is he just crazy? But then a man named Ananias is sent to him by this very same spirit, by this very same light that has flashed from heaven. And this Ananias comes to Saul and says, The Lord Jesus has sent me so that you may see. And at that moment, the text tells us, quote, Scales fell from Saul's eyes. And he perceived clearly what had just happened to him and what he was being called to do. All because, in a flash, the Spirit of God came upon him. And all because another man named Ananias ministered to him and validated for him what he just experienced. Let me tell you a story. The summer before I left for college, a friend and I spent an evening outside of Charlotte at a Bible study. This friend and I lingered afterward for a while, and therefore we got a late jump on our return to High Point, our hometown, which was some 90 minutes away. And because I knew that this particular friend had no compunction about transgressing speed laws, I gave him the keys to my car, inviting him to drive us home. I figured this was the best way to get us home by our curfew. Well, it had been raining off and on that night, and the roads were pretty slick. My friend, meanwhile, was driving as if they were not. Well, we'd been on the road for about 30 minutes or so when my friend, now driving upwards of 105 miles per hour, true story, decided to try to pass two 18-wheelers on a two-lane road. And when my friend went to make the pass, there was indeed a broken yellow line. However, by the time he got around that 18-wheeler, that broken line had turned into a double yellow because the road ahead had begun to slightly bend. Thus, when my friend went to steer us back into the proper lane, our tires did not gain traction, and our car, therefore, began to hydroplane. Well, for about 20 yards, we slid forward at a 45-degree angle, at which point the rear driver's side of the car hit a telephone pole and sent the car spinning. Then from there, we did some 13 spins before the front passenger side collided with the corner of a red brick house, that corner jutting some two feet into the vehicle. And that collision, of course, brought the car to an immediate stop. Well, for my part, as the passenger, I had irresponsibly not been wearing a seatbelt. So thankfully, I had been thrown into the back seat of the car before the impact occurred. Meanwhile, the rear window inexplicably shattered outward, protecting me from the shards of glass that would have come raining down on me like a thunderstorm. Somehow, both my friend and I walked out of that car that night without so much as a scratch upon us. Well, shortly after that wreck took place, a highway patrolman arrived on the scene. And after asking us a few questions, he radioed the station and instructed them to call our parents. This was, of course, before cell phones were available. And then he invited us to sit in the back of his patrol car while we waited. The officer was both kind and severe. He did not sugarcoat his disgust at our recklessness. 
But he also realized that we were teenagers and traumatized. And so he treated us with a sort of measured gentleness. And so now comes the reason for my telling you this story this morning. When my parents finally arrived, and as they caught sight of the ravaged car lodged into the corner of that house, and as they rushed over to embrace me, and as my mother became a weeping mess, and as my father looked on as if he'd just seen a ghost, suddenly that police officer standing right there beside us said to my parents this, You know, this boy of yours ought not to be alive right now. His life has been spared for a purpose. God has plans for this young man. And no sooner had he said that than he was gone, seemingly disappearing into the night. Not vanishing, mind you. I just mean we continued hugging, and as we prepared to leave, we never saw him again. That same fall... Some two months later, and now at college for my freshman year, that same fall, I received a letter from my uncle. And in that letter, my uncle told me that out of nowhere, he'd had the strangest image come to his mind. There was an image of me standing before a crowd talking about Jesus. And he said in that letter that he wanted to share it with me because as peculiar as the experience was, he couldn't shake the feeling that it was something he was supposed to share with me, that he thought that it meant that God had plans for me, plans for me to one day stand before crowds. Who knew in what capacity, he said, and talk to them about Jesus. Well, fast forward another seven or eight years. And now I'm standing before a high school English class as a teacher, reading to them from Mark Twain and then giving an extended monologue about the morality of the story. And after I finish, one of the kids in the class says, Mr. Cardi, I don't think you're supposed to be an English teacher. I think you're supposed to be a preacher because you sure talk like one. <laughs> it was meant to be a joke, but the kid was also quite serious. Well, fast forward another four years, and now I'm in divinity school, and I found a wonderful mentor in a man named James Dunn, a well-respected scholar and pastor, and one afternoon, I'm telling him that I'm not sure what I'm doing at divinity school, not sure what I intend to do upon graduation, when suddenly James Dunn says to me this, don't you see, son, you're a pastor, no point in trying to pretend otherwise. God has called you to this. Now for the point that I'm trying to make with all of these stories to truly register, you have to first understand this. I knew something significant had happened when I didn't die that night. And when that policeman had made such a bold proclamation upon me, but I didn't perceive what it meant. And I knew that my uncle's letter was sincere that day, and I had no doubt that he really did experience this peculiar vision. But I didn't yet perceive that it really meant anything about my future. And I knew that that kid's joke about me being a preacher was more than just his attempt at making the class laugh and that he'd intended it as a compliment. But I didn't yet perceive that he was telling me something about who I really was. No, it was not until James Dunn, some 12 years after that car accident, said to me, Don't you see, son, you're a pastor. God has called you to this. It was only then that I suddenly perceived what had happened in that flash of light that night outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. It was only then that the scales fell from my eyes and that I realized that God was calling me to something specific. And so here then is my point in telling you any of this. It's to say that flashes of light like these do happen to us. 
And not only to those of us who have been called to vocational ministry. No, all day, every day, bolts of lightning flash from heaven, penetrating the souls and spirits of human beings. Peculiar encounters, inexplicable coincidences, unbelievable news, uncanny experiences. But, and here's the point, but struck by these bolts of lightning, seldom do we who have been struck recognize in the moment the totality of what has just happened to us. Seldom do we know the full extent of the power that has just come over us, what it was and whence it came. And therefore, like Saul, we continue to grope around in a state of blindness, most often explaining away these uncanny experiences by telling ourselves that we just imagined it or by deciding it was mere wish fulfillment or by calling it some sort of psychological distortion, or even by telling ourselves that we must be crazy. And that is why God also puts Ananiases around us, people who help validate for us what we have seen and undergone and experienced, people like my uncle and people like that boy in my English class. And people like James Dunn, people who in essence say to us, whether intentionally or unintentionally, the Lord Jesus has sent me so that you may see. Dear family, this sermon is my long way of saying this. The Lord Jesus has sent me today so that you may see. That uncanny experience you had perhaps long, long ago, that thing you're too embarrassed to tell others about because just saying it out loud makes you sound crazy, that thing you've buried and explained away as mere coincidence because really, how could it have been what you really thought it was? I'm here today to tell you that that was a flash of light from heaven. I'm here to help remove the scales from your eyes. I'm here to tell you that we are never alone, for God is with us. I'm here to tell you that the same Holy Spirit that came over those disciples and sent them bravely out into the street. The same Holy Spirit upon whom we sit even now expectantly waiting. I'm here to tell you that this same Holy Spirit is active in this world yet. And I'm here to tell you that a community of faith, a community of faith like this one right here at Boulevard, I'm here to tell you that a community of faith is called to be a community of Ananiases to and for one another. A community of people willing to listen to one another's stories. Willing to sit with one another in suspension of judgment. Willing to listen carefully to one another and help one another discern whether something really was an act of God or whether it was more likely a projection of one's imagination. Because make no mistake, that happens too. Yes, a community of faith, a church is supposed to be, is called to be a community of people willing to listen to one another and then willing to say to one another in response, so funny you say that, for I too have had the strangest encounter. Let me tell you about mine. You are to be witnesses of these things, Jesus tells his disciples. So let us be unafraid to be witnesses of these things in our own lives. 
And then let us be equally willing to be Ananiases for one another, disciples prepared to validate the witnesses of others. For make no mistake, a light from heaven can flash. And the one on whom it flashes will quite likely be blind to what it means in the moment. And in order for that one to have scales fall from his or her eyes, it requires another one willing to go to him or her saying, The Lord Jesus has sent me so that you may see. Prepare yourselves, dear family. Light from heaven will soon enough flash once more here at Boulevard Baptist Church. The only question is this. When it does, will we listen to the Ananiases that the scales may fall from our eyes and that we may see and go and do? Amen.